Hello, I am ecstatic, I am excited, it is all wonderful and good because this is the end of the catch up everyone, this is great, I am doing the last day of the catch up, I'm feeling kind of teary eyed because it's finally here, no I'm just playing. I am very excited that um, what seemed like forever to do, I have finally been able to do, and we are catching up, high flow, we are catching up, and so this is Friday's video, so tomorrow we will be doing Monday's video on the actual day it's due, um, and I'm making some changes, um, I... Believe it or not, I've always been a morning person. I have not been a late night person. That was the extent of my life for most of my life. Um, and I think I'm going back to being a morning person because it works better. So um, I am transitioning slowly but surely. Hi, Tanya. Uh, back to uh, maybe doing these videos in the morning instead of saving them at night. Because uh, some of the reasons why they get skipped over is because by the nighttime, if I'm too tired, it's a wrap, right? Or if I have something that I do that goes late night, it's a wrap. So I think I'm going to try to transition to morning. Not going to promise you that that's going to happen tomorrow. Not promising you at all, considering I'm doing late night tonight. Um, but in some time in the near future, we're going to try to transition these uh, to the morning. So... We will see. But nevertheless, uh, the catch-up is real. We are here. Um, we are doing uh, the last video. I have not been this on track since way back when my stepfather was in the hospital, actually, right before he passed. is when I got so off track. Um, and uh, now I'm getting back on track, finally. And let me tell you how uh, being that off track has let me know um, that I don't want to get that off track again. So I'm just excited that we're back on track. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and start. Okay, so I won't ramble this whole video. So we are doing um, Second Chronicles 21 through 24. Second Chronicles 21 through 24. And uh, we are, well, we left off talking about Jehoshaphat's reign. Um, and we talked about, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Um, but we talked about how, um, jo Joseph had called a fast, right? Um, because he had heard that, uh, some kings were coming against him and he talked to the Lord about it. And basically the Lord said, well, this battle is not yours. It's mine. Don't even worry about it. Um, and the Lord took care of everything for him. All they had to do was stand still and seek the salvation of the Lord. Um, and uh, by the time they got to the camp, uh, the Lord had caused the enemies to fight each other. Um, and when they got there, it was just a whole bunch of dead bodies everywhere. Um, oh, Tanya's asking a question. What time in the morning? I don't know. I usually get up between 530 and 6. So um, anytime. And then I have lots of time in the morning. Um Anytime, it could be anytime, Tanya, between, I would say, uh, 6 and 8. So, anytime between 6 and 8, I could actually do a video. So, we'll see what actually happens, Tanya. Um, but like I said, I'm not sure if that's going to start tomorrow or not. But I am planning to transition to that. But anyway, so, um, um, by the time they got there, right, um, God had caused the enemies to turn on each other. Um, and there were a whole bunch of dead bodies. And all they had to do was collect the plunder. Took them three days to collect the plunder. The fourth day, they held an assembly and just praised God and just thanked God for um, uh, uh, giving them the battle. Um, and then after that, um, it tells you a little bit about Jehoshaphat's reign. Um, um, tells you that he tried to do another alliance again with the king of Israel. And it didn't work. Um, and then we open up with chapter 21, where it actually just goes right into the fact that Jehoshaphat rested 
with the kings. And um, after Jehoshaphat, um, uh, Jehoram, um, who was his son, became king. Um, and Jehoram, when he became king, um, remember his mother um, would have been in Ahab's family, right? Because remember, uh, Jehoshaphat um, had a lesion with Ahab or alliance, I think it's called, with Ahab by marriage. That's what it said. He had alliance with Ahab by marriage. So remember, Jehoram's mother would have been in Ahab's family and Ahab was the bad king in Israel. Um, and because of that, you know, think about his mother's influence on him. His mother probably was serving other gods. And, you know, um, uh, when she would go to her family reunions, right? I'm sure they didn't call it that. But um, she would be over there in Israel with all of them, right? Um, and so what happened? Um, he did not follow the ways of uh, Jehoshaphat. As a matter of fact, it says Jehoram. In chapter 6, I'm sorry, in chapter 21, verse 6, it said, He followed the ways of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done. For he married uh, a daughter of Ahab. So not only um, was his father um, uh, by alliance um, and marriage in Ahab's family somewhere, now here is his son also marrying uh, someone in Ahab's family. And so uh, because of this, it just uh, um, was inevitable almost that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. When you think of Ahab, you think of evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? And so if you're uh, uh, messing around with his family, right, that evil mixed with good and he let the evil overtake the good. Um, but verse seven, which is very important, says, nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him and his descendants forever. So even though Jehoram was not acting right and God wanted to and could have said, you know what? That's it. Right. Because of David. And how faithful David was. God was all the way these hundreds of years later saying, you know what? I'm going to be faithful to the word that I gave to David hundreds of years before. Um, that's a testament right there. That's an awesome testament. And so um, what happens is uh, it goes on to tell you what was wrong with Jehoram, right? You might say he was an evil king. What was he doing? Well, let's listen to this, right? In verse, um, uh, let's see, uh, let's start at verse 8. In the time of Jehoram, Eden rebelled against Judah and set up its own king. So Jehoram went there with his officers and all his chariots. The Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he rose up and broke through by night. To this day, Edom has been in rebellion against Judah. So Libna revolted at the same time because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord, the God of his ancestors. So in other words, all of these things were happening. All of these wars were breaking out and people like rising up against them because they had not kept the covenant. Um, they had forsaken God and followed other gods. And because of that, this is what was happening. And he said, um, in verse 11, that he had also built high places. So instead of like all the other kings um, that were good and had the Lord on their mind, what you hear from them is that when they came into uh, kingship, they started tearing down high places, right? Even if they never made it all the way to Israel and tore down um, the high places in Israel and got rid of um, um, the golden calves that Jeroboam put up, um, it still says at least they dealt with what was going on in Judah and they would tear down um, the high places in Judah. But instead, what you have here is Jehoram is building up high places. In other words, he's creating places for people to serve false gods. He's creating places for people to worship things that are not God. Um, and so he received a prophecy. And this was interesting to me because the prophecy did not come from the prophet standing before him. 
um, you know, God, God didn't send the prophet to him uh, more than likely because he was such an evil king that he would have had the prophet either jailed or killed. Right. So God did not even send the prophet to him. God had Elijah write a letter to him. And we know about Elijah. Right. Um, God had Elijah write a letter to him, a letter of prophecy to him. Um, and it says um, in verse 12 of chapter 21, Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet, which said, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David says, you have not followed the ways of your father, Jehoshaphat or of Asa. You didn't follow what your father or your grandfather did. Right. Um, but you have followed the ways of the kings of Israel and you have led Judah and the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves just as the house of Ahab did. You have also murdered your own brothers because when he came into a uh, kingship, he just killed everybody. Right. He's like, I want to make sure that the kingdom stays mine. So I'm going to kill all my brothers. Right. He says you have mur murdered your own brothers, members of your own family, men who were better than you. So God is like, look, one of them could have been king and it would have been better off. But you have murdered men who were better than you. So now the Lord is about to strike your people. Your sons, your wives, and everything that is yours will be very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels until the disease causes your bowels to come out. Mm. And so he says, he's going to, I skipped the line. Um, so now the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and everything that is yours with a heavy blow. Then it says, you yourself will be very ill with the lingering disease of the bowels until the disease causes your bowels to come out, right? And so what happened was um, um, everything the Lord said. Everything the Lord said would happen. Um, the Lord aroused himself against Jehoram and the hostility of the Philistines and the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. They attacked Judah. Um, they invaded it and carried off all the goods found in the king's palace together with all the sons and all the wives. And so this was the heavy blow that he was going to have to deal with. All his sons and all his wives were taken, right? And it says, not a son was left to him except Ahaziah, the youngest, right? So they only left the youngest son. And then after that, everything the Lord said was going to happen, right? Uh, he got a disease of the bowels and um, um, it went on. The Lord says he was in great pain. Um, great pain in the course of time at the end of the second year. And then his bowels came out because of the disease and he died in great pain. And the people made no funeral fire in his honor um, and like they had done for his predecessors. He was king for 32 years. And listen to this. And this is not, you got to make sure that this is never the testament of your life. It says um, he was king for 32 years. Uh, no, he was 32 years. Sorry. He was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. This is the verse I'm trying to get to. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. He passed away to no one's regret. That is not the state of affairs that you want to leave yourself in. All right. So after um um, after he died, right, Jehoram died, then his son, remember that youngest son, his son, Ahaziah, uh, became king. Um, and when we read about this in second Kings, we don't realize, um, that all of Ahaziah's brothers have been killed. And that's why he became king. He wasn't next in line. He wasn't the oldest, which is where it was naturally going. Um, but he became king because they took all of the rest and we're about to find out here that they killed him, right? It says in chapter 22, verse one, the people of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, Jehoram's youngest son, king in his palace since the raiders who came with the Arabs into the camp had killed all the older sons. So all the older sons had been killed. So it was no other lineage to be son, but Ahaziah. He was 22, year, 22 years old when he became king, um, and he reigned in Jerusalem only one year. And it said he too followed the ways of um, the house of Ahab. 
Um, so you see how, and it's amazing to me, because um, if you really look at it, um, Jerusalem and Judah was having good kings until Jehoshaphat kind of mixed with uh, King Ahab. And then the next thing from there is like Jehoshaphat and then his son, Jehoshaphat was good up to a point, but he kept making these bad decisions based on who his father-in-law was, right? Um, but then his son was a bad king, and now his son's son was a bad king, right? Um, it says, um, he too followed the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother encouraged him to act wickedly. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as the house of Ahab had done. For after his father's death, they became his advisors to his undoing. So, after his father died, sorry about that, I got the window open so I know you hear all that traffic. But after his father died, he started going to uh, Ahab and his people for advice. They became his advisors, the word of God says here, to his undoing. In other words, that he started listening to them and that's when the whole problem started in the first place. Um, he followed their counsel when he went with Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, to wage war. So he was listening to what they were saying. And that's where he got injured. If you remember the story in Kings, um, he got injured in that battle um, and wounded. And he went back to Jezreel because he was wounded, trying to recover from his wounds um, that he had inflicted. Uh, but then he died, right? Um, Ahaziah went to see him. Um, um, I'm sorry, Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to Jezreel to see Joram, son of Ahab. So, um, the son of Ahab, I'm sorry, uh, again, when they start throwing in all these kings, um, the son of Ahab is the one, um, who got wounded, but he had linked up with the son of Ahab in order to do this war, and the Lord was not pleased with him at all. Um, because again, God was saying, I set you aside as a remnant and now you're acting like the people that I, de that I purposely set you aside from, like the kingdom was split so that they can go do their thing and I can keep my thing over here. But here you have, um, because of the mixing of marriages, right? Um, here you have the God's people that he set aside to be his people, a remnant from the remnant, right? Um, is acting like the other set. Um, because they keep mixing with them. And that's a word. That's a word. We can stay there. That is a word, right? Um, and so um, what happens is, if you remember back to Kings, it doesn't tell us the details here in Chronicles. But if you remember back to King, God sort of hires Jehu to kind of take out hey, everything that was Ahab, everything that was left of Ahab. Sorry, guys. As you can see, starting to sweat, right? Um, but he hires Jehu to take out everything um, that was um, Ahab. And so Jehu comes along. He, he receives this prophecy um, and he comes along and he takes out everybody. But what happened is because Ahaziah was in the mix, he actually ends up getting killed too, right? Because he was in the mix. He, if he had stayed in his own kingdom, in his own lane, doing his own thing, he would have been fine. Um and, but it says here, while Jehu was executing judgment, I'm in verse 8 of chapter 22. While Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he found the officials of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's relatives who had been attending Ahaziah, and he killed them. He then went in search of Ahaziah, and his men captured him while he was hiding in Samaria. He was brought to Jehu and put to death. Wrong place, wrong time. You over here with him. I'm, execute, I'm executing judgment over here on Ahab and uh, you too close. And so guess what? You're going to get killed too. And then um, it says they buried him. Um, he was the son of Jehoshaphat. Um, and so they went and got him and buried him because, because of Jehoshaphat. Because his daddy was a good man, they went and got him and buried him. But at this time, there was no other king. Um, no other son, and I'll tell you why. Uh, let's read down to verse 10. When Athelia, the mother of Ahaziah, now remember Athelia was the daughter of Ahab, okay? The daughter of Ahab. When Athelia, the mother of a, a which means her mother was Jezebel. So let's just make this plain, okay? So 
Athaliah was the daughter of Ahab, the daughter of Jezebel, mother of Jezebel. I mean, the daughter of Jezebel. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah. In other words, she killed everybody. She killed all the sons. Why? Because she wanted to be the leader. And so the only way she could be the leader is if she killed everybody that was supposed to come in leadership. And so she killed everybody um, except they had hidden Joash, who was only one years old at the time. And they had hidden Joash. And because they hid him, she didn't know he existed. So she actually ended up reigning over Judah for six years um, while they were growing up um, uh, Joash to be able to take over the kingdom at, at the ripe old age of seven. <laughs> um, can you even imagine um, the ripe old age of seven, right? I have a grandson who's about that age, not... Um, and can you imagine Tony, who's, you know, that age, um, saying that he's going to be the king over a whole nation, right? So the truth of the matter is that when they crowned Joash king, um, and killed Athalia, which they do that, um, the person who did it was Jehoda the priest. Now, if you think about it, um, Joash was only seven years old. Jehoda the priest is the one who, who hid him away in the first place. And Jehovah the priest is the one who came um, at the appointed time and set up the way for him to become king. He, he told the, uh, the priests that were guarding uh, the temple, hey, y'all come guard the king. We about to make him king. OK, uh, so the truth of the matter, if we really, really think about it, Jehovah probably was the one running this kingdom when he was seven years old. Jehovah was telling him what to do, what to say. Um, how to listen to the Lord, how to know where to go and what to do and what to say. And when he didn't make the right decision, Jehovah would help him make it. Um, so he was very close to Joash the king. I mean, grew him up in the kingship. Um, and so um, once we get to chapter 24 and we see, um, in my opinion, um, uh, Jehovah's, uh, who was the priest, Jehovah's direct influence on Joash because Joash became very, very, very um, um, focused on uh, restoration. And I think that was that was all the priest. That was all Jehovah. And he wanted to restore the temple um, and temple worship and how things were, were supposed to be done. And so um, he became king at seven, it tells us in chapter 24. Um, and he, he did what was right in the sight, uh, in the sight of the Lord. Um, he did what was right. Um, and then he decided that he wanted to restore the temple of the Lord. And like I said, I think this was the direct influence of Jehovah, the priest. Um, and so he called them together and said, hey, we need some money to restore the temple. Um, and the priest didn't go right out right away and get the taxes from the people that they should. Um, and it doesn't say why they didn't do it. They just didn't do it. Um, so then... Um, Joash devises another plan instead. He puts, you know, uh, a, a big sort of, uh, what are they calling it here? A big chest in front of the temple and basically said, okay, just bring whatever you had. And people just started bringing and bringing, bringing. Um, verse 10 says, all the officials and all people brought their contributions gladly, dropping them into the chest until it was full. Whenever the chest was brought in by the Levites, to the king's officials, and they saw that there was a large amount of money, the royal secretary and the officer of the chief priest would come and empty the chest and carry it back to his place. And so it was just like a rotation. They would keep the chest out there until the chest got filled. When the chest got filled, they would come back, empty the chest, pay some people to continue to doing the restoration work on the temple, and then they would go back out there and the people would bring more. And that was just how it went, right? And over and over again, people were just blessing and blessing, um, and the temple was being rebuilt. So much so that when it finally got done, it was money left over, and they had money to actually pay for some of the things that they wanted to put inside the temple. Um, and then listen at, um, uh, verse 15 says, now Jehoda was old and full of years and he died. This is the priest and he died at the age of 130. 
he was buried with the kings. Now he's a priest, but he was buried with the kings. Unheard of that a priest be buried with the kings, but he was buried with the kings in the city of David because of the good he had done in Israel for God and his temple. But then listen, right after, right after the priest who had been leading and guiding Joash all his life as king, he does total abandonment of what Jehovah had been teaching him all of his life. And it says in verse 17, after the death of Jehovah, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king and he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and worshipped Asherah poles and idols. Because of their guilt, God's anger came on Judah and Jerusalem. Although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him, and though they testified against them, they would not listen. And so they had, as soon as the priest died, the priest um, that was, you know, sort of uh, giving uh, Joash all this advice, as soon as the priest died, I can imagine Jehovah didn't let these people come near him, right? But now there's no buffer. There's nobody guarding him to keep these people from away from him. So as soon as the priest died, here come these people to say, I don't know why we was doing it this way, but let's do it this way instead, right? And before you know it, he's all off into idol worship. Um, it's, now listen to this. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehovah the priest. So Jehovah's son, Zechariah, and you think about it, that, Je you know, um, Jehovah was so close to Joash from the age of seven, raised him up as a king, you would think that it's possible that Jehovah's son, Zechariah, could have been similar in age. It doesn't say he was, but it could, he could have been similar in age um, to uh, Joash, but it doesn't say. Um, but here comes Zechariah. He stood before the people and said, this is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's command? You will not prosper because you have forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. Mm. And that's our memory verse because I really, really want you to remember that. Um, and that is found in verse um, 20, right? Second half of verse 20. Why um, do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper because you have forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. And I made that the memory verse. I know it's not happy, happy, joy, joy, right? I made it the memory verse because I want you to really pay attention to the fact of this. Um, why did you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Um, so it's letting you know if you disobey God's commands, you can't be prosperous. But we can always flip that around, right? If you want to be prosperous, obey the Lord's commands, right? Um, and then it says, uh, because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. Um, and we can turn that around, right? If you don't want the Lord to forsake you, don't forsake him, right? Um, so remember those things. Um, but listen, verse 21 says, but they plotted against him. And by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. And listen to this, by order of the king, who was the king? Joash. So we're talking about this wonderful kid who served God for 40 years as a king, who started at age seven, who did this wonderful thing, which was restoring the, the temple of God. Uh, now he's killing priests. Yes, he has been reduced to killing priests, y'all. Um, he kills Zachariah. He um, tells them, go ahead, stone them. It says, if he put the rocks in their hands, he gave them permission to stone um, a priest, everyone. Um, and it says here in verse 22, King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father, Jehovah, has shown him all his life. Come on, all his life. You are alive because I had you hidden. Come on. Showed him kindness all his life. But he didn't remember any of that. And he killed the son of the person who got him where he was in the first place. Um, and while Zechariah was dying, he was still prophesying. 
on his deathbed. It says while he was laying down on the ground, dying, he was still prophesying. May the Lord see this and call you to account, right? Um, and then finally, it tells us about Joash's death and burial, right? Um, it says when um, um, at the turn of the year, the Arameans came um, against them again. Because remember, every time they went against God, what, he, what would he do? He would send an army against them, right? So the Arameans came, um, and they and the Bible says they only came with a few men. They didn't even come. They didn't even come. They did the amount of men that they came with against Judah should not have been enough to take over the amount of men that Judah had. But God wanted um, to show them that this was because of your sin that this is happening. Um, so with only a few men, the Lord delivered into their hands a much larger army. Because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, judgment was executed on Joash. Then it says, when the um, Arameans withdrew, they left Joash severely wounded. His officials conspired against him for murdering the son of Jehoda the priest, and they killed him in his bed. And so um, uh, they, he was wounded in the battle, um, but when he got back to his bedroom, um, those who was closest to him said, oh yeah, we about to get you now. You already have dead. We about to kill you all the way for killing the priest. And so they killed him for killing the priest. Um, and then it names those who conspired against him was Zabad um, and, um, and uh, Jehozabad um, and the account of his sons um, and everything else that happened, right, is here. Um, it says, um, but that he was killed because of um, just, I mean, what a life, right? He lived this beautiful life where he was doing what the Lord said and restoring the temple and all of that. And the next thing you know, he is just a uh, killing priest. It's just, it's horrible. Um, and then um, that's the end of chapter 24. Um, and yay, we are on target, everyone. So on tomorrow, we will be going to 2 Chronicles 25 through 28. Uh, we're going to um, talk about Amaziah, who is uh, going to take over after Joash, right? Um, we're going to talk about him. Um, and then we're going to talk about Uzai, um, who is also known as um, Azaria, right? Um, he's called Azaria in... Uh, the book of Kings, um, and only called Uzai once, but here they call him Uzai most of the time. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Jotham, um, and his reign in Judah. Um, and we're going to uh, talk about Ahaz. And so we will continue on to talk about the Kings of Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, the Kings of Judah. Um, and remember, we're talking about this because we're talking to an exile community that's getting ready to go back to a place they don't, they're unfamiliar with. They don't even know it, right? But they're getting ready to go back there. Um, and the Lord um, is having the priest break it down to them uh, who is who and who gets what, right? All right. Until next time, you be blessed. Please know that I love you and God loves you too. In Jesus' name, amen.